day to day. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Senator Hutchison, we're so pleased to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, Kay Bailey Hutchison has a remarkable political lineage. Her great-great-grandfather, Charles S. Taylor, was a signer of the Texas Declaration of Independence. She graduated herself from the University of Texas law firm, but then went to work as a TV reporter because no Houston law firm was willing to hire a woman lawyer. She started a small business, became the first Republican woman in the Texas legislature. She was elected state treasurer in 1990, and in 1993 won a special election to take over the seat that was opened up when Lloyd Benson became Treasury Secretary for President uh, Clinton. She's been reelected three times and is now the senior Republican woman in the Senate. She's retiring, uh, as you know, from the Senate when her term's up at the end of this year, and I suspect those Houston law firms would be very glad to have you on staff at this point. <laughs> your first uh, office in of, uh, your first official office in Washington was at the National Transportation Safety Board. Mm -hmm. President Ford appointed you as the vice chairman there in 1976. And I wonder if you could describe what things were like for a woman appointee to a top job like that now and compare it with how things have changed or perhaps how things have not changed so much in Washington for women in positions of power. Well, I think that um, there was the beginning of an effort uh, to bring women in, and uh, Susan, you and I were talking in the backstage about Ann Armstrong, who um, had been my mentor. She was the first co-chairman of the Republican National Committee, and my first fo foray into Washington was in 1969 or 70 uh, with Ann Armstrong, and it was she who promoted me to President Ford uh, for this uh, position. I, I was pretty young at the time, um, maybe 26 or something. And, um, but there was an effort. There was an effort, and um, I loved that experience. It was my first real experience, besides an internship earlier in my college career uh, in Washington. And I got my feet wet, and there were a small cadre of women um, who were appointees of the president, and I, I thought it was uh, great that we were beginning to build, uh, but it was the building time. Uh, now, I think it's uh, standard. We've seen women in the very top jobs uh, and uh, Secretary of States uh, on throughout the cabinet, and we've, we've got 17 women senators and um, 17, approximately 17% 17 of the House and Senate are uh, women. So I think things are uh, coming our way. The 17 women senators now, uh, is the relationship among women senators, especially across party lines, different from the relationship among male senators across party lines? I don't know for sure what the guys do, but um, <laughs> we do have a bond. Um, the women senators had dinner together last night. Uh, we all chipped in to give Susan Collins, who is getting married in August, our colleague, uh, a gift certificate um, to a spa. <laughs> and we thought, you know, what would we love the most? And so we got together and decided to do that for her. Um, Hillary Clinton gave me a baby shower uh, when I got my little daughter. And so it's those kinds of things. And the, I guess what we do in our dinners and our social um, contacts are just talk about the, either the obstacles we face or the information we need. Uh, if we've got children here, information about schools or where to live, uh, how you manage uh, going back and forth to your home state. Um, and we've made different choices. Uh, some choose to have their children with them here. Some choose to keep them at home in their environments. Very hard choice. And so we're always uh, getting advice from each other. And um, it's a great relationship. And it doesn't usually impinge on our voting. We vote our states. We vote our philosophies. We don't pressure each other to 
change something because we all understand that our constituent is our first responsibility. But as far as camaraderie and an understanding that not very many women have about the uh, kinds of obstacles we face, uh, it's a, it's really fun and interesting. Now I'm pretty sure the men don't get together and have a dinner and chip in to buy a spa certificate for the one who's getting married. So that's probably something <laughs> distinctly uh, that for the female side. You know, it's, it, so you have this very civil conversation about yeah. common concerns and so on. If there were 83 women in the Senate and 17 men instead of the reverse, would things be different? Would things be different either in the policies enacted or in the kind of tone? that is taken, the way, the approach that the Senate takes toward doing its business? You know, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Um, we all get elected the same way. We run campaigns. Usually they're tough. Uh, we have toughened up um, to meet those challenges. So in many ways, uh, I think men campaign against women now uh, approximately the same way they do against each other. Um, and I think that also applies in the Senate. Um, I would say our governing styles differ somewhat in that we really do, I, I think every one of us wants to get something done. We want to accomplish things. We want to bring people together and hammer it out. Sometimes that isn't the case mm -hmm. in the big Senate. Well, in fact, we know that the Senate, the Congress generally seems pretty frozen and hostile and, and so polarized along partisan lines. Is there, is there a way out of that, do you think? Well, first of all, the Senate is a pretty collegial place. Mm -hmm. um, I think even more so than the House uh, because we do have more open rules and therefore minorities have more power in the Senate than they do in the House. In the House, everything is done by the majority. In the Senate, the minority can stop legislation with 41 votes. They can have, and we have a great working relationship with our colleagues, always understanding that we may differ on philosophy. We may differ on um, the way things are done. But in the end, understanding that everyone wants to do the best they can for their states and for their philosophies. So uh, some of my best friends are Democrats um, and also Republicans. But I think we do have friendships across the aisle um, in the Senate. And we always know, and has certainly happened a lot in my tenure in the Senate, if you're in the majority today, you may well be in the minority tomorrow. And so you get along. And you don't break uh, bonds. You don't burn bridges. You, if you lose, you live to fight another day. And when you win, you're a gracious winner. This dinner sounds so interesting. How long did the dinner of women senators, how long has that been going on? And how did it get started? Well, it really started when, um, the women senators met with the women leaders of Northern Ireland. And we started um, trying to encourage them about their role in trying to bring peace. And we started telling war stories about our experiences and how we were elected and how we overcame obstacles and how we broke into the uh, men's club. and. It's, it was so interesting that um, Barbara Mikulski, who's the senior Democrat, and I uh, said, you know, there's a book here. And the, we were nine at the time, nine women senators. And um, we uh, went to Bob Barnett, um, who is the sort of uh, book um, uh, contractor for uh, many people in Washington, Republican and Democrat. And we said, we want to write a book. And would you see if any publishers are interested? Bottom line, we wrote a book called Nine and Counting. Uh, and each of us uh, wrote our own chapter about our different obstacles. 
And the one uh, charity that we could agree uh, that all the proceeds would go to, uh, because most of us had had the experience of being Girl Scouts, was the Girl Scouts. So we wrote the book and uh, gave the proceeds to the Girl Scouts. And um, it has been a book that's kind of a um, encouragement for young girls, especially, or uh, women who have faced obstacles, or maybe they're trying to overcome a challenge right now. Um, and it, it really sold quite well. And so that was the beginning. And then we decided to start meeting. Uh, and we, may, we meet about every six weeks or so uh, for dinner. And um, we enjoy each other's company and I think have um, built great comrades. We're going to go to the audience for questions. I'm just going to ask one last one. And that is, so there were nine senators now, women senators, 17. Uh, there were nine senators then. Uh, of the female persuasion, 17 mm -hmm. now, I guess that's progress, although it's not the kind of dramatic progress I think people sometimes mm -hmm. expected. Do you think that uh, you will see a woman elected president? Oh, yes, I do. When, when do you think that will happen? Well, I thought it would have happened now, <laughs> by now. Um, but I do think it will happen, and it, I think we are becoming so much more equal in our experience and credentials that it's less of a factor uh, now. And so I think it will happen when the time is right for the woman's philosophy. Because I think we're tough enough. I think we are treated pretty much the same. Um, I think people don't think of us as women candidates as much anymore. They think of us as, OK, what's your what do you want to do? What are your plans? What's your platform? And they vote their own interests. And that's good, I think. Let's go to the audience. Does someone have a question for Senator Hutchison? Okay. You know, I actually have another question I want to ask. So let's pretend I'm a member of the audience, which is, you know, you interview a male senator about 15 minutes after he's won his first election, and he's thinking he really ought to be in the White House. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much for himself, it's for the good of the country, really, <laughs> he should go to the White House. And you interview women who have been in the Senate, sometimes for ex multiple terms like yourself, and uh, they do not seem to make that assumption that it's, the White House is really where they're headed. Uh, why, in general, do you think that perception's true? And in particular, you yourself, lots of men, male politicians in Texas, think they should be president, have run. Some, some of them have won. Just this year, two Texans were running for the Republican nomination, Governor Perry and Congressman Paul. Why, why, have you ever thought about running for president yourself? And if, if so, why did you decide not to do it? Well, yes, I have. And I would love to have had the right timing. But timing is everything in life. And I um, adopted my two children. Um, 11 years ago, and so that kind of put me out of the capability. I, I go home every weekend, so I wasn't here for the Sunday shows to um, build my name identification um, in the way that you would if you were running for president. And I haven't been able to do some of the things that would prepare. Also, up until really this year, um, it was kind of a um, given that the person with the most seniority and the most um, logical next step choice would run for president. This year, amazingly, people just popped up and ran for president. <laughs> that um, I mean, if if it, if I were 15 years younger and my children were already gone, I could have run for president. Um, back under these rules back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to have run for president, but the timing wasn't right. Um, I never felt, like you said, that when I was elected, I was uh, ready to run the country, and wouldn't they be lucky? And I have met those people in the Senate, <laughs> Susan. Um, but, um, and I do think women generally uh, are more humble. All of the women who've been elected have had to overcome so much. You know, um, and they've had to mostly deal with 
running their homes, having children, the 24-7 uh, experience of that. And, uh, and then also, on top of that, uh, overcome the obstacles to a woman's election, which we've had in the last 25 years. So um, I, I found when I wrote my books about women trailblazers that the women who were in the first, um, who were in the arena first, uh, generally didn't succeed to the highest level that they hoped, but they did set the stage. And it was the second tranche of women in those fields that did hit the top. And I think um, in many ways that's where, the, I'm in the first tranche, and I think the next tranche will be the woman president. Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.